Now we're going to talk about exercise associated hyponatremia or EAH. EAH is commonly defined as a sodium level less than 135 that shows up during or within 24 to 48 hours of some sort of endurance sport or exercise event, such as a triathlon, marathon, ultra marathon, but it can also show up in simple hikes in very hot weather like we commonly see in the Grand Canyon. It is important to note that it is preventable. Additionally, in roughly 30 to 50% of cases, it's asymptomatic. So you'll have a person with a low sodium and have absolutely no symptoms. But when a person does have symptoms, it's often hard to differentiate those from another illness or disease. Here's a slide showing some of the mild symptoms, the moderate symptoms, and the more severe symptoms. Overall, they are highly variable from person to person and there isn't any direct correlation with the severity of hyponatremia and the symptoms, although in general, we tend to see severe symptoms with a sodium less than 126. The only symptom that is more commonly seen in hyponatremia as opposed to other syndromes such as heat illness or altitude illness is actually vomiting. There have been reports of people with a full-on encephalopathy and a sodium of only 132. So as I said, you can't immediately correlate the sodium level to the symptoms. But there's also been uh, some endurance athletes with a sodium less than 125 who are completely asymptomatic. So once again, normally less than 126 is when you'll start to see your severe symptoms. This slide is here just as an example to show how Often, these symptoms or signs of EAH overlap with other outdoor-related diagnoses, such as heat illness or altitude-related illness. And we're not going to be talking about how to manage hyponatremia in the hospital or emergency department, but rather how you might manage it as a medical director or medical provider for some sort of event, such as a ultramarathon across the Gobi Desert. Overall, the pathophysiology of EAH is multifactorial starting often with increased fluid intake. A normal healthy person engaging in an endurance event should be able to consume about 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters of water per hour without harm due to increased renal excretion combined with insensible losses and sweating. Most cases of EAH are not due to too much fluid, but this can contribute to the overall problem. Additionally, too much fluid intake is often evidenced by weight gain. And that's why, as we'll talk about later, a lot of endurance races will have way stations along the way to sort of try and pick up on people taking in too much fluid and having an inappropriate excretion of that fluid. Persistent ADH secretion, ADH being antidiuretic hormone, is the running theory to the main culprit of EAH, or exercise-associated hyponatremia. In a normal person, when you increase your water intake, normally the kidneys suppress the secretion of ADH. This will generally lead to larger volumes of urine that is more dilute, somewhere around 50 milliasms per kilogram. For some reason, in the case of EAH, when you increase your water intake, somehow, some way, the kidneys will actually increase your ADH. What this leads to is very concentrated urine you'll have a high urine sodium concentration, and overall the concentration of urine will be triple what it's supposed to be. Okay, This will additionally lead to, as they believe, EAH. And it's not just the inappropriate kidney excretion of ADH that's the culprit due to increased water intake, but there are other factors, such as exercise. During exercise, you will actually secrete inflammatory cytokines, which are known to increase ADH secretion, also just the stress in general, along with things like NSAIDs, concomitant SSRIs, hypoglycemia, all those things can increase your ADH secretion and worsen the likelihood of getting EAH. Other causes that we can talk about very briefly are sodium sweat loss. Sweating may contribute to a sort of false hypovolemia and trigger additional ADH release. There's also a thing known as non-osmotic sodium stores. Not all of the sodium in your body is floating around in your blood and your cells. Some actually attaches to glycosaminoglycans that are commonly found in things like bone and cartilage. 
What happens in a normal person is when your sodium starts to drop, your body can access those glycosaminoglycans, causing a release of sodium from that area. But there are two possibilities that occurs in certain endurance athletes. One is that a person cannot access those sodium stores. So even though you need them, the glycosaminoglycans are not releasing them appropriately. Or conversely, you have inappropriate storage. Your glycosaminoglycans for some reason are binding more sodium than they're supposed to. Now once again, this is all in the early stages of discovery, but as we go on, potentially we might find out more and more about exercise-associated hyponatremia and the underlying causes. Now let's talk about how we actually treat it and diagnose it. So it's recommended that all endurance races have stat sodium testing, but you might be in a situation where you don't. So first let's talk about stat sodium testing, imagining that maybe you're the medical director or a medical provider during an ultra marathon and you have access to a stat sodium machine. You have a person that presents to your medical tent with some vague signs and symptoms, maybe consistent with hyponatremia, but could be related to heat illness. You do an infield sodium and it's less than 135, so technically exercise associated hyponatremia. You need to ask yourself if they're stable. Okay? If they're stable, meaning maybe they just have a few symptoms such as muscle cramping, some fatigue, maybe some mild nausea, maybe a headache, yes, they're stable. What do you do about it? You want to do hypotonic fluid restriction. Do not get them drinking a lot of water. That's not what they need. That will only make things worse. Have them eat salty snacks or even give them a hypertonic broth. We'll talk about how to make that in a moment. You're going to want to observe them at least 60 minutes. Um, you want to make sure they urinate. And then you can repeat the sodium testing. Now, whether you need to evacuate this person or cancel them from the event will be up to you. But this is a stable patient that you're going to be at least observing for 60 minutes. Now, if it's unstable patient, meaning they have signs and symptoms of severe hyponatremia, including encephalopathy or even pulmonary edema, that's actually a symptom that we didn't talk about but can be seen in severe hyponatremia, you're going to want to be treating them aggressively. And if you have infield sodium testing, you probably have access to hypertonic saline and IV kits. So you're going to get an IV on them, and you're going to push 100 cc's of 3% hypertonic saline. You're going to repeat that at least two times every 10 minutes uh, based on their symptoms and get a repeat sodium level. These patients you need to evacuate. They're at high risk of complications. Generally, you should expect to see the sodium rise by 4 to 5 points um, within about 20, 30, maybe 60 minutes. Okay, so that's why you need that repeat sodium level. Let's say you're in a situation such as just hiking along the Grand Canyon or you're a part of a first responder team and don't have access to sodium measurement. You're going to ask the similar first question, is the patient stable? If the patient is stable and you suspect that hyponatremia could be the cause of their symptoms, you're going to actually fluid restrict. You're going to give them a hypertonic broth to drink and you're going to plan for evacuation because you can't tell whether this is hyponatremia or something else and you really don't want to mess around. If they're not stable, meaning they have those severe signs and symptoms, once again, if you have access to the hypertonic broth and they can tolerate PO, go ahead and give it to them. If you have a more advanced medical kit with your 3% saline, give it to them. Most recommended Guidelines do not say to repeat the hypertonic saline in these patients because we don't know if that's the true underlying cause. But in general, one dose of hypertonic saline has fewer risks than benefits. So giving it at least once is a good idea in somebody who is unstable. And then, as always, we plan for evacuation. Here's a flow chart that, that sort of gives you an idea of how you can manage um, critical exercise-associated hyponatremia with and without the blood electrolyte measurement availability. This is from the Wilderness Medical Society guidelines that we have the link to. I mentioned the hypertonic broth. Pretty simple to make. You just grab four bullion cubes, whatever your flavor of choice is, add it to 125 cc's of water, and this is going to give you a 9% sodium oral solution. Easy to make, easy to do. Now let's talk about those collapsed patients. Yep, that guy down here. It's estimated that about 6 to 30% of collapsed patients 
in endurance events will have a low sodium. So if you're asked to take care of a patient who has collapsed, don't assume they're just overly tired or dehydrated. If you have the availability, get that sodium test and go down that algorithm that we've already talked about. And finally, as we mentioned earlier, this is a preventable condition. Um, the basic guidelines are simple. You need to drink according to thirst. Some people try to plan their event saying they're going to drink a certain amount every hour. But rather, what you should really do is let your thirst be your guide to prevent overhydration and then that whole cascade of inappropriate ADH secretion, weight gain, so on and so forth. Some marathons and endurance races actually reduce the availability of liquids. So in the Ironman triathlon, you can only have a water station or fluid station every 2.5 kilometers during the run and then every 20 kilometers during the bike ride. And it's actually been shown to decrease the incidence of EAH. Also, you can do way stations. Uh, the idea is not to gain any weight, but rather maintain your weight or lose weight. If you're gaining weight, then that likely means that you're in the early stages of um, exercise-associated hyponatremia. Once upon a time, there used to be the guideline of adding sodium to your uh, drinks uh, in the form of sodium supplementation. There's really no evidence to support this, but some um, sports experts still recommend it. Uh, sports drinks such as Gatorade, uh, Powerade, they have sodium and potassium in them, but overall they are hypotonic. So overconsumption of these drinks can actually worsen EAH and lead to a higher prevalence of it. So you need to sort of take that with a grain of salt. Most of your, your fluids that you're going to get during an endurance race will have some sodium and potassium in them, but it's unclear if it actually helps prevent EAH. So at the end of the day, we've talked about the pathophysiology. We know what to do when we have a patient that may or may not have exercise-associated hyponatremia, specifically if we have access to stat testing. Um, and then ultimately, we want to try to prevent this at the end of the day.